Hello, I'm Jim Vieira. I'm an author and a researcher. And today I'd like to share my research on a strange subject, the lost world of Edgar Cayce. I call it strange or I identify it as strange because when I first got into the Edgar Cayce readings, um, most of them are actually uh, on holistic health. And by virtue of that, I started to uh, look at different ways of nutrition and, and meditation and ways to, uh, to live life that uh, created outcomes that were much more benevolent. But I started to um, delve deeper into his readings and his records, and it started to uh, show me a strange world you know, of the past, a world that's in conflict with modern, modern day theory. So I wanted to um, give an overview of the Casey material and show how it, you know, blends together through comparative analysis with many different uh, sources all around the planet. Religious documents, the readings of the Rosicrucians and Freemasons, other mystics like Rudolf Steiner, Plato's readings, and uh, to see and to sift through all this information, my goal was to um, create a comparative analysis where I could show that basically all the same strange and specific things that Casey said were also parroted by all these other sources in different eras of time. And, you know, I didn't um, go into this with a confirmation bias. I would, you know, take a subject and say, do the Freemasons talk about this? Do the Rosicrucians? Does Madame Blavatsky? And I kept finding over and over again that this was the case. So I'll stop by talking a little about Casey. He was born in 1877 in Hopkinsville, Kentucky, uh, the son of a, a minister. He was a very conservative Christian and essentially only had an eighth grade education. The only book he really read was the Bible, which he read over and over again. And he um, went into a trance-like state and started to recite health readings for people early in his life. I won't get into that story because it's been written about at length and there's many really good books that that talk about his early life and how he started uh, channeling or uh, revealing information in a trance-like state. Now the belief is that he tapped into the Akashic Records, the universal library that basically is, is a warehouse of all that happens in the realm of time and space in this universe. Now that seems a little far-fetched maybe for some, but you'll, you'll soon say, see that everywhere that Casey goes in his readings, there's some corroborative proof or another source that, that uh, seems to uh, show that there was something to what he was saying. Now, Casey had predictions about the future that eventually didn't come true. So skeptics sometimes dismiss all of Casey's material like, oh, there's nothing there. But Casey himself said, you can't really predict the future. There are so many variables. But when he looks and pairs back into the past, he seems to create this coherent alternative story of history that is verified by a number of sources I will discuss. You know, I wanted to touch on uh, how I got into uh, a holistic approach to not just life, but archaeology, anthropology, and, uh, you know, human origins. You know, I, let me put it this way. When you go to the doctor and uh, you get to get your appendix out, it's a great thing there is a surgeon there. But oftentimes you, you go to a medical professional and they're not going to tell you to eat better or to exercise or to try different supplements or meditation. It, it's really um, an allopathic orientation. And I would advocate that, you know, archaeology and anthropology maybe embrace a more holistic approach to look at oral traditions and these, uh, you know, documents of the mystics and, you know, kind of literature that is considered mythological to see if there's some truth in it to lead them to where to investigate or to perceptually shift and look at things differently. So for me personally, you know, I'll tell a little story about my family right here uh, and how I got into, you know, a holistic approach, how I got into the Edgar Casey readings. You know, I'll start with my, my son, Kyle. Uh, my ex, Kimmy, and I adopted Kyle when he was three years old. He had a really tough time. I don't want to reveal too many details, but he had a, a particularly uh, challenging first three years of life and we adopted him after he fell out of a 35-foot window and was taken into uh, custody of, of Children and Family Services in Massachusetts. Uh, when we got Kyle, he was very regressed in, in all his cognitive abilities. Uh, he would have horrendous night terrors. He would sleep two or three hours a night and just scream on the floor and, and uh, 
just just had a, a ter terrible um, neurological profile, overstimulated bruxism, uh, like I said, night terrors. And a friend of mine was uh, um, a neurofeedback practitioner who said, oh, let's get your son in and get him some sleep. And I was like, you know, by a month in of being an adopted father, I was at my wit's end. I'm like, well, what do I do? How do I handle the situation? So anyways, we started with neurofeedback therapy. And within a week, Kyle was sleeping 12 hours a night and all his night terrors had dissipated. And as time went on, things improved more and more for him as we did this alternative therapy. And I also uh, you know, created these protocols with other professionals, uh, naturopaths, and basically um, kind of rebuilt his immune system and took a holistic approach to his parenting and to his uh, um, health issues and, and neurology issues. So now, you know, 20 years later, uh, Kyle lives with me uh, still. Uh, which is a good thing. He's a good kid. He is uh, working different jobs, um, you know, graduated high school and, you know, has been a success story because his um, diagnosis is a rather intractable condition called reactive attachment disorder. And, um, you know, I just felt compelled to share the story uh, because it allowed me to, to look at things differently and a holistic approach to health and different alternatives to treat, uh, you know, once considered intractable conditions. And I'll switch to my ex, Kimmy. Uh, she had a horrific case of ulcerative colitis for many years. And uh, basically she was bleeding to death. She had like the, the final stages of colitis. Uh, it's an inflammatory disease of the bowel and it's just, uh, uh, you basically bleed to death if it's just unchecked. And the Western way to handle this is to remove the large intestine or in Crohn's uh, to remove the small intestine. and I took her home uh, from the hospital uh, one night and she was about 80 pounds. I just took her home to die with some dignity because they were gonna take out her large intestine and she couldn't survive the surgery. And I got a call in the middle of the night from a naturopath I had reached out to. And he said, you know, come bring her by, I can help her. And I was like, you can help her, what are you out of your mind? So I take her there to this, this gentleman, Barry Edelman, uh, who's this brilliant naturopath on the run from the FBI. So it fits perfectly with my screwed up life story. And I took Kimmy and what, uh, to him, and what he used was this, uh, it was a Ed Skilling electromedical device with Royal Rife and Tesla and Lakovsky's technology uh, all kind of blended into it. And what it does is it, it kills parasites, it, it, it kind of, um, it identifies uh, the different energetic signatures of all the organs and basically uh, sends out a harmonic wave so you, your organs become in balance. Uh, I got Ki uh, Kimmy on, on wheatgrass juice that she would take as implants and drink. If you've ever had wheatgrass juice, it's, it's really tough to put down. She would drink two eight ounce glasses a day and basically built up her immune system and defied you know, the medical world and came back to life. And Kimmy now, is she has her own, um, hair cutting studio and she's doing very well, has very little symptoms. And, it, you know, to me and to everybody who uh, knew, kn who knows her, it's, it's just like a medical miracle. So another like, wow, you know, moment for me. And this isn't bullshit, you know, I'm blowing smoke to like talk up, you know, my game or anything like that. These events all happened to us. And then I'll talk about me briefly. When I was playing football, I <clears throat> had a traumatic brain injury, a skull fracture, and, um, I had this, this massive concussion and the coach, it was the dark ages, sent me back in with a swollen brain during the game. So I ended up you know, with a traumatic brain injury that I had to deal with and didn't know anything about. And back then it, it was you know, not known like it is today with CTE and everything. So I um, ended up getting a severe seizure disorder and I would have waves and waves of petty mal, you know, small seizures. And uh, all throughout the night in that sleeping and wake zone, I would get just, just uh, inundated with, with multiple seizures and I would get so depressed. My entire world was gray for weeks on end. I couldn't move and nobody knew what was wrong with me. And then I had grand mal seizures in front of my family and I would convulse for eight or nine minutes and have to be sent to the hospital. And um, you know, I, once again, I, I just, uh, I didn't know what to do. I was so depressed and I, it was so challenging just to get up out of bed every day. So I started to do neurofeedback myself, uh, just like Kyle did. And I started to do uh, different supplementations and basically take a holistic approach to health. Instead of taking 
you know, medication after medication, which I took, and it wasn't really successful. I took a holistic approach. Now at this point, I take no medication. I haven't had any auras or any seizures for about 15 years. So there is something to this holistic approach. And this kind of forced me to get into um, the Edgar Cayce readings and his ideas about uh, holistic health and, and well-being. So I just wanted to share that with you. This is how I you know, fell into this world. And it's based on personal experience. It's not just a story I read in a book. I want to um, shift now to <clears throat> oral tradition and written history by Richard Dawson. Well, one of the things is, uh, that modern science has done has really uh, eliminated 10,000 or more years of, of uh, evidence in the form of oral traditions of indigenous people. I want to uh, tell you what, he, what Dawson had to say here. Scientific historical method reverencing the documentary source gives short shrift to oral tradition. Such standard manuals as in the United States as um, Homer C. Hockett's Introduction to Research in American History and J. Franklin Jameson's The American Historian's Raw Material warn the graduate student and serious scholar to avoid legend and tradition and folklore, all dirty words in the current lexicon of historiography. So you don't learn this when you're in school. You don't learn this when you're in college. When you're in these scientific disciplines, it's like those are just you know, myths and fantasies, uh, these ideas about the past. And we can only rely on a stack of data sheets you know, driven by a left-brain, male-dominated uh, you know, academic uh, curriculum. And I, I don't agree with that at all. In fact, I feel like there is operant conditioning that's going on in the sciences. And what you get with operant conditioning is, you know, according to this principle, actions that are followed by desirable outcomes are mo more likely to be repeated, while those followed by undesirable outcomes are less likely to be repeated. Now, if I was an academic talking about some of these things here, I would get negative feedback. I wouldn't get tenure. I would get, you know, basically ostracized as a nut job. And I would rather um, side with the shaman than the modern day scientists. You know, in reality, I would side with both in the middle because I think the, the ancient peoples blended science with spirituality, but we've separated b both of them. And I, now we have a mess in our world of, of hyper-materialism and, and uh, you know, distraction and, and things that don't fulfill you know, your soul at all. So <laughs> here's an example of operant conditioning. My cat, Linus, I've trained him in reverse, you know, so he knows everything to do to get me out of bed to feed him all night long, and I can't stop it. So it's my own lab experiment, <laughs> and I have to share that because you can see what's, what's happening the way that, um, um, you know, animals, creatures, humans are trained in a certain way with positive and negative reinforcement. Uh, so once again, here is Casey. You know, a lot of what he said was simple, wise uh, words like this, like, Anyone can find fault. It is the wise person who finds that which encourages another in the turmoils and strifes of the day. He's in this trance state giving these readings, these benevolent readings, understanding and articulating the holographic nature of the universe, the way we're all interconnected. Uh, and, and he really, you know, gives these kind of encouraging uh, readings over and over again. So a lot of what he had to say wasn't based on ancient mysteries. But in a trance-like state, he started to talk about things that frankly disturbed him as a conservative Christian, like the idea of past lives and the idea of lost civilizations. And one of the lost civilizations that Casey talked about was indeed Atlantis. Now it gets scoffed at as a mythological idea that Plato made up, but you'll see that there's much more to the story than that. This is what supposedly happened to Atlantis. And in fact, there are new scientific discoveries uh, uh, one in particular called the Younger Dry's Impact Event. And 12,900 years ago, some massive event happened that could have been the biblical flood. A recent ice age was triggered by a firestorm bigger than the one that killed the dinosaurs. It lasted a thousand years. 12,800 years ago, Earth was struck by a disintegrating comet setting off global firestorms. In fact, in this date, 10% of the Earth's landmass was destroyed by fire. Now, Casey gives a date of 12,600 years ago as the destruction of Atlantis. So that's pretty interesting. So this is one of Casey's readings. Please give a few details regarding the physiognomy, habits, customs, and costumes of the people of Atlantis uh, during the first period before the destruction. 
They took on, size, on many sizes as to stature, from that as may be called the midget to the giants, for there were giants in the earth in those days, men as tall as what would be termed today 10 or 12 feet in stature and well proportioned throughout. <clears throat> so Plato also talks about Atlantis, the great Athenian philosopher. He's the primary source in his Timaeus and Critias. One of the criticisms is that of skeptics is that Plato is the only one who spoke of Atlantis, and I will you know, prove that men who lived before him and after him actually spoke about it too. So Plato says that Egypt has recorded and kept eternally the wisdom of the old times, all coming from time immemorial when gods governed the earth in the dawn of civilization. They all talk about, all these sources talk about the gods and these long-lived beings and giants existing uh, in Atlantis. Giants were supposed to be a part of the population, just like little people and regular-sized humans, but they were often portrayed as androgynous and supernatural and long-lived. So the Library of Alexandria is where Plato was talking about. He visited there with Herodotus. He studied the ancient texts. And unfortunately, as you know, the Library of Alexandria was destroyed in two separate uh, fires. So we wouldn't be having this conversation today, I believe, if the library still existed, because all this evidence would be laid out for us to read. So there is literary, literary evidence of Greek individuals visiting Egypt, especially to acquire knowledge, e.g. Herodotus and Plato. And here's Herodotus right now, who in fact lived before Plato. And this is what he says. Near this salt hill is a mountain named Atlas. After this mountain, these received their name, for they are called Atlanteans. He also refers to the sea uh, beyond the Pillars of Hercules as the Sea of Atlantis. Now, Casey and Plato and others, they specifically put uh, Atlantis in the middle of the Atlantic. Near the Canaries of the Azores, maybe, sometimes there's an island chain that stretches to Bimini, but this is the, the general location. You know, This is what the mystics and the chroniclers say. It's not in other places in the world. It's not uh, in Antarctica and other things that people have proposed. I'm not saying, you know, I don't have a time machine. I don't know. I'm just saying this is what all the sources say. <clears throat> so Diodorus has this, this to say in his uh, library of history. The Atlantides inhabited a rich country bordering upon the ocean, and they boast that the gods were born among them. In a word, this island is so delightful that it appears to be the abode of the gods rather than human beings. So Pliny says, beyond the Aquilion, one finds a blessed nation called, according to tradition, the Hyperboreans. Among them, men reach an extreme age. Many marvels are told of this people. The country is bathed in sunlight and enjoys a pleasant temperature. And there are many other chronicles who spoke about Atlantis as well. Theopompus relates the particulars of an interview between Midas, king of Phrygia, and Selenius. And this is what Selenius has to say. Europe, Asia, and Libya are islands washed on their shores by the ocean, and there is but one continent which is situated outside these limits. Its expanse is immense. It produced very large animals and people twice as tall as those common to our climate, and they live twice as long. This is what exactly... Uh, what Casey was saying in a trance-like state in the 30s about Atlantis. So in the nature of animals, uh, we hear, those living near the ocean tell the tale of the ancient Atlantean kings, tracing their lineage from Neptune. And they wore bands made from sea rams upon their head. Now, Homer talks about Agigia, and uh, Homer's often, you know, dismissed as a, you know, a mythologist who really just made this stuff up. But many researchers think that Homer was actually tuning into these ancient chronicles and laying out an actual picture of the past. So he talks about Agigia, uh, the home of the nymph Calypso, the daughter of the Titan Atlas, also known as Atlantis. He is talking about Agigia as a real place in the Atlantic. So the geographer Strabo says and proposes that Agigia was located in the middle of the Atlantic. Plutarch says the same thing. The Aegean Isle lies far out to sea, um, distant five days, sail from Britain, going westward, and three others distant from it. So this is interesting. This is what Plato says about the Aegean flood. He argues that this flood occurred 10,000 years before his time, 10,600 B.C. Remember the 12,800 
or 10,800 BC date of the Younger Dryas impact event, as opposed to only one or 2,000 years that have elapsed since the discovery of music and other inventions. So the other great mystic, Rudolf Steiner, another seminal thinker, had this to say, everything that refers to giants and legends is absolutely based on knowledge of the truth. We feel it to be absolutely correct from the spiritual scientific point of view that the giants are stupid and the dwarfs are very clever. You know, little people are also discussed as uh, being inhabitants of Atlantis. So the Rosicrucians ha have this to say, there were, two tri um, there were two prime facts that stand out. One is that there were giants in the earth in those days, and the other that the patriarchs, the gods, lived for centuries. In the Rosicrucian Digest, this is really um, a very interesting uh, passage. Richard Cassaro showed me this. He's a um, occultist and a researcher. So in this issue, we explore the mysteries of the lost continent of Atlantis, one of the most powerful and enduring ideas of the Western world and of Rosicrucian heritage. There is no doubt that the Rosicrucians and Freemasons believed in Atlantis. The old masters who made it their object of their lives to gather together one more of these scattered, once more these scattered fragments and to reconstruct the occult doctrine of the Atlanteans found a portion of their material in Egypt, India, Persia, Chaldea, Medea, China, Assyria, ancient Greece, and also in the mystic records of the Hebrews, such as the Kabbalah and the Zohar. The common source, however, may be regarded as distinctly oriental. That the great philosophies of the East, in fact, may be said to have been built upon the base of still more ancient teachings. Moreover, the great Grecian teachings are believed to have been based upon knowledge from the same common source. So, at the last, the secret doctrine of the Rosicrucians may be said to be the secret doctrine of, the, of Atlantis, transmitted through the descendants of the people of that great center of occult knowledge. So all these sources are basically pointing back to Atlantis as the origin of this uh, uh, wisdom. So Rosicrucian science confirmed right here. This is a giant skeleton account from the 1930s. Here is Termier, the uh, oceanographer. Atlantis is the subject of a short but important article appearing in the annual report of the Board of Regents of the Smithsonian Institution in 1915. M. Pierre Termier, a member of the uh, Academy of Sciences and Director of Services of the Geological Chart of France. In 1912, he delivered a lecture on the Atlantean hypothesis before the Institut Oceanographique. It is the translated notes of this remarkable lecture that are published in the Smithsonian Report. After a long period of disdainful indifference, writes Termier, observe how in the last few years science is returning to the study of Atlantis. How many naturalists, geologists, zoologists, botanists are asking one another today whether Plato has not transmitted to us with slight amplification a page from the actual history of mankind. And once again, like I said before, the Rosicrucians and the Freemasons both talked about Atlantis. Manly P. Hall, the great Rosicrucian thinker, uh, who actually uh, had R Ronald Reagan, the president, as one of his students, uh, wrote Atlantis and the Gods of Antiquity. And Madame Blavatsky, the, the psychic and the head of the Theosophist Society, also talked about it as well. However altered in this general aspect, Plato's narrative bears the impress of truth upon it. It may not be who invented it. <clears throat> it was not he who invented it at any rate, since Homer, who preceded him by many centuries, also speaks of the Atlanteans and on their island in his Odyssey. Therefore, the tradition was older than the bard of Ulysses. Blavatsky also connects Chinese and Indian mythology to the story and biological and geological evidence of her time. The whole continent of Atlantis was submerged in water, or so the story goes. Blavatsky claims that cataclysm was the source of all stories of deluges in mythology, including the Bible. So we know from the Bible uh, that there was this belief in giants. There's actually 23 giant accounts in the Bible. Some you're very familiar with. This one from Deuteronomy, you may not be. A people great and tall, the sons of Anakim, <coughs> who, you, who you know of, um, who you know and of whom you have heard it said, who can stand before the sons of Anak. There are some that believe this is the Anunnaki of Samaria, the, this Anakim right here. So K Casey had readings about a variety of subjects, but he also links um, 
the mound builders of the United States with, with these descendants that moved up from Mesoamerica and founded the American um, mound builders. So we have 68 readings about the, the mound builders. The entity sojourns then were with those of a race of unusual height, unusual proportions to what may be termed in the present, for they were the lords of the land. And this is written about in the Mound Builder book by uh, Little Van Aken and his wife, Greg's wife, Laura. Now the Mound Builders, uh, I've discussed at length in other talks, uh, they created geometric forms, um, earthen mounds, and they had a strong presence all across uh, ancient Eastern America. They created uh, structures that predicted eclipses. And I'll just roll through some of these images that show the level of sophistication. In fact, let me skip back here. Uh, Casey said that a lot of these mounds were representations of the experiences of the Atlantean people, that they were created to remember what had happened and in the world that was left. And here is a now destroyed Portsmouth, Ohio earthwork, and here is Plato's central city of Atlantis. Casey specifically states that. Once again, maybe an odd coincidence, probably not. Now, as, as strange as some of what Casey had to say was, what was really odd and struck me, and I ignored for a long time, was this idea of androgynous creator gods being the architects of humanity. Basically, as I'll show, that Plato and others talk about our original state was androgynous meaning sexless beings who procreated the way amoeba split, if you will. And, uh, you know, I know that's hard to wrap your head around, but let me lay out my case for androgynous creator gods. <clears throat> so this is Casey's biographer, W.H. Church. In the early days of Amelius' rule, the separation of the sexes had not yet begun to take place. Though male in their outward aspect, the androgynous sons of God embodied within themselves the nature of both male and female in one person. By turning to the creative forces, they could become channels to bring into being androgynous progeny after their own kind, imbued with a double soul and a double sex body. In this way, sexual intercourse was unnecessary as a means of propagation. Now, that doesn't sound like too much fun, not having any sex, but you'll see that these other sources and other gods were characterized the same way. And, and I'll say that what Casey talked about the founding of Atlantis, 210,000 BC. He, he essentially said that we are here as spirits trapped in bodies that basically came down and got enmeshed into the material world and forgot our true home. And that's what the hell we're doing here. It kind of makes sense. And I'm just gonna say that's what he had to say. And he also talked about cataclysms in 50,000 BC, 28,000 BC, and the final in 10,600 BC. So. H.V. Hilprecht, um, in his book, The Babylonian Expedition of, um, by the University of Pennsylvania, states this about the androgynous beings of Samaria. This androgynous nature, this ability to beget out of himself, his own ego, this self-existence is inherent in each and every god of the Sumerians. All Sumerian gods are androgynous. So Casey's got an eighth grade education in this weird trance-like state going through the universal records and transmitting exactly what this noted scholar is talking about in ancient Samaria. And we know uh, many people are familiar with the god Oannes, the hybrid fish being who emerged uh, from the sea, from the Persian Gulf, to, to teach the Sumerians mathematics and geometry. He is known as androgynous. And then Dagon, the Philistines' uh, serpent god or fish god, See, he has breasts and a beard, is represented as androgynous. <clears throat> and you have representations of him all over the place. What's interesting to me is that the Dogon people uh, have this story about it that I'll share in a minute. The Dogon are in Mali, Africa, and the French colonized the area in the 1930s, I believe. And two French anthropologists sat with the blind elder, Oga Matoli, and he told them all about their, their past. And he said the wisdom that the Dogon have uh, was shared by androgynous fish beings from, from Sirius, extraterrestrial beings. Now, that sounds strange, but you will find all around the world these extraterrestri extraterrestrial androgynous uh, fish gods are supposed to be the culture heroes that you know, imbued uh, all these civilizations with, with their uh, sophisticated knowledge. So here is an archetype of the Nomo. 
and they are androgynous. They are fish beings, you see, with all the fish tails. Here is a double-headed statue that indicates that, that um, androgyny right here. So Casey simply compares this type of conception with that of the lowly amoeba, who pushes out from uh, within itself another separate body, splitting its own gene pool. The culture hero of China is called Fu Xia Nua, a androgynous fish being who shows up, teaches the I Ching, the arts of civilization, geometry and mathematics, just like in many other places. And these are from old tombs in China, these, these reliefs are taken. And it's a, a androgynous fish being that is being portrayed. Just like Ola Kuhn in West Africa, another androgynous fish being. Very specific. It's not, oh, the gods came from the sky, blah, blah, blah. It is like androgyny and, and um, amphibious creatures teaching us math. And, you know, it, it really, uh, <clears throat> the, the strange and specific nature of it catches my attention, I'll say that. And in West Africa, they still have these festivals to honor these androgynous fish beings. And in Hindu culture, you have Vishnu and Matsya, that these, these wisdom keepers who are portrayed as fish beings. In fact, you go over to South America, and at the Bennett monolith, this giant uh, monolith is displaying, it could be Viracocha or one of the creator gods, he has fish scales right here, and he is known to be androgynous. The mysterious Olmecs have an androgynous god who is a fish god as well. And here, my friend J.J. Ainsworth shared this with me, that these mermaid-like creatures exist there. This is what Manly P. Hall, the great Freemason thinker, says. The mythologies of many nations contain accounts of gods who came out of the sea. Certain shamans among the American Indians tell of the holy men dressed in bird feathers and wampum who rose out of the blue waters and instructed them in the arts and crafts. Among, them, among the legends of the Chaldeans is that of Oannes, a partly amphibious creature who came out of the sea and taught the savage people along the shore to read and write till the soil, cultivate herbs for healing, study the stars, establish rational forms of government, and become conversant with the sacred mysteries. The same story is told all around the globe that these weird fish beings are the ones who promulgated this, this information. Now in <clears throat> the Olmec site of Laventa, I believe this uh, representation of Quasicodal was found between 1200 and 1800 BC. Now in it, he is carrying this strange man bag that uh, has been talked about over and over again by different ancient mystery researches. researches. The thing about Quasicodal was he was born the offspring of Omatiotl, who was an androgynous god. Viracocha is known to be androgynous as well. You can just go through the old records and there's all these representations that he wasn't male or it wasn't male. It was an androgynous divine being who was long lived. <coughs> in Plato's Symposium, Plato who also talked about a great flood in Atlantis, Aristophanes displays knowledge of an ancient myth, myth of the androgen, according to which our original nature was by no means the same as it is now. When the androgen was split into two halves, the distinct male and female sexes were created. And here's a, uh, an image of that on a vase, the male and the female, uh, the, the ancient depiction of androgyny. So Philo of Alexandria took up Plato's dualistic conception of the creation as well. In fact, references to a race of androgens which once inhabited the world occur in the myths of both East and West. In the Western tradition, this primordial androgen is to be found in the writings of the Kabbalists, Gnostics, Neoplatonists, Swedenborgianists, and Theosophists. The Rosicrucians have this to say, Mankind was male-female before being separated into two distinct sexes as man and woman. Uh, during the period when man was thus constituted, fertilization must have occurred within himself, nor is this any stranger than in many plants that are fertilized today. Steiner, Rudolf Steiner, he describes the point in evolution at which human beings split from being androgynous to, and single sex to becoming male and female. So all these different sources are saying the same kind of bizarre thing about androgyny and is portrayed in statues and iconography around the world. Here are some examples of androgynous gods, just a few of them all around the planet. Some of them you know, like Viracocha is in there. The Gnostics believe this story. Uh, the Taoists. 
the secret societies, the Rosicrucians and the Freemasons, <clears throat> they kept the symbolism going, the idea of androgyny being a first state in the sacred mysteries embedded in these uh, uh, difficult to decipher um, figures that they presented and, and because they were persecuted for so many years. Here you go, there's another androgynous being. <coughs> Excuse me. Even the Knights Templar worshiped Baphomet, which was an androgynous being. Now you could see why the Christians wanted to put him to death because they thought this was some demonic um, you know, uh, personage here. But in reality, it is a balance of opposites. It is the, the beasts and the, the female and the male and a blending of, of, of all opposites. It's not a demonic symbol. So this is uh, <coughs> what a researcher uh, found um, while discussing in, in, I'm sorry, this is what a researcher unveiled about some of the old uh, statues in the world. It is hard to believe that people have already been devoted to a singular androgynous deity 20,000 years ago, but the Paleolithic structures are, sculptures are quite explicit. Many multi-headed sculptures have been found, and one of the oldest identifiable ones made of ivory was found at Gagarin 22,000 years ago in Ukraine. So there it is right there. And Eret Ziffer explains that the idea of androgynous created deities existed in his paper, The First Atom, Androgyny, and the Ayin Ghazal Two-Headed Busts. Now here's a picture of these two-headed busts. 8250 BC, these were found in Ayin Ghazal, Jordan. Here's a picture at the uh, Jordan, I mean, uh, the British Museum of them. Now Ziffer says uh, that these represented this parent race of humans, and in fact, uh, the statues there and statues from Jordan that are basically of the same age, both are representing androgyny and polydactylism, six fingers and six toes. And this is what Ziffer says. I would like to suggest that these statues represented mythical ancestors from the dawn of mankind and that the two-headed busts among the, them represent the first human being, the androgynous prototype of humanity. Now, this is a sober academic basically seeing the same thing about the statues, the iconography, and this ancient idea of androgyny. <clears throat> and you find these at Cal Tepe, uh, Janus, the two-headed go Roman god, on Boa Island in Ireland. On one side you have the male, and on the other you have the female. Very interesting that you find this all around the globe. <clears throat> in the Olmec site, uh, while I was at the museum, I found this androgynous god with this kind of like mohawk, a halo around it, a uh, halo. Uh, humano Asexuado, this is an androgynous god of the Olmecs. So Manly P. Hall says this, Among many ancient peoples, God was considered as being androgynous and referred to the great father-mother. When the creator was represented by an image, various subtle devices were employed to indicate its hermaphroditic nature. Now, a lot of the gods that are spoken about aren't the, the universal god of religion, you know, the god that exists outside of time and space that has no form. It's basically these, these parent race beings or these androgynous beings that are being pointed to. Whether you believe it or not, the ancient peoples were talking about the series of gods who had six fingers and toes, who were sometimes aquatic or androgynous. The Isara... Uh, Iswara of the Hindus is depicted with one side of the body male and the other female. In Greek and Roman statuary, frequent examples are found of a masculine divinity wearing female garments and vice versa. In fact, at the temple of Esna, we have the god Kanum making humans out of clay on a potter's wheel. It's, it's a, a theme that is shared around the world that we are basically genetically engineered by these androgynous beings who showed up after the flood, who showed up from another uh, planet, you know, uh, that, that's one of the theories as well. So the Temple of Esna was dedicated to an androgynous, nameless, omnipotent creator god, which manifested itself both as male and female, Kanum and Kanum Ra. And this is from the Universe uh, Encyclopedia of Egyptology. So what, what I'm trying to do here is blend <coughs> all these accounts from academic journals and, and uh, ancient chronicles documents. And just to make the case, it, it's not that, like I said, it's a confirmation bias and I want to fit everything in to tell this wild story about the past. It is that all these different disparate sources are saying the same strange and specific thing. 
and I know I'm repeating myself over and over again, but that's, you know, that's the thing I like to share that I don't think there's a nothing story here. I really think there's something compelling going on. And this idea of androgyny is so off the wall. How can it be portrayed in isolated uh, Pacific islands in Australia and all throughout the world? And how can creator gods who are long lived amphibious and androgynous be attributed with, with sharing the arts of civilization? and sophisticated geometry and plowing the fields and social engineering and urban planning. It, it really seems, uh, it just, um, it, it strikes me as, as just uh, astoundingly coincidental, you know, that, that um, this could be the case without there being some truth to the story. So Kanum is listed as the creator of humans. He created humans out of uh, clay just like Viracocha, the androgynous god of, of uh, the ancient Inca, just like uh, Fu Xi and Nuwa in China. He created humans, or it created humans, out of clay. Just like in Genesis in the Bible, humans are created out of clay. And it, it's probably not, oh, you hear some dirt, let's create some humans. They, I think what they're pointing to is that humans are a genetic creation of an extraterrestrial race. I have to say this, maybe not with a straight face. And one of the lower forms, like a Homo erectus, is something that existed on this planet. Because you have this um, evolution that just has sped up uh, since Homo sapiens seemed to appear on the planet. And the way our brain capacity works and uh, evolution is supposed to work, uh, it just doesn't fit. It, it would have taken like 26 million years for us to get to where we are through normal evolution. It seems like there was a genetic intervention. Now, I'm not saying their evolution doesn't exist. I'm not in conflict with science. But can't there be coexisting realities where there is evolution, but humans at the same time seem to have been created genetically by another species that has come to this place, just like every ancient source says, right? In geology, we have uh, coexisting theories. We have uniformitarianism, the slow and gradual process of change, but we also have catastrophism. In archaeology, we, we have a belief that... Uh, we started at primitive state and now we're at the apex of civilization. Can there be a coexisting reality or theory that says there have been several rises and falls of civilization? And it looks like that. When the, you look at the oldest megalithic structures on the planet, they are the most sophisticated. It seems like we went in reverse for quite a while and now going in a different direction. So that doesn't negate what science is saying, which has a pretty good grasp on what was going on in the last 10,000 years but were these other cycles occurring? So these, these are the questions I ask. Can there be coexisting realities you know, in these scientific disciplines to explain all the strange phenomena? Now, Kanum, oddly enough, is displayed with six fingers at the Temple of Vesna. So some of these um, <clears throat> stories of humans being created uh, Greek, Sumerian, Babylon, Babylonian, Laotian, Native American, Maori, Yoruba, Christian, and Muslim, they all claim humans were created of the clay of the earth in supernatural fashion. And here is Kanum right here, creating humans on a potter's wheel. And Fushi and Nuwa created humans. You go, it, it's not like, oh, I really want this, this to be true. Let me check this document. It's just laid out there for anybody to read, for anyone to see. To, to piece this whole strange story together. And then we have Veracocha, the androgynous deity who emerged from Lake Titicaca, the way Oannes, the fish god, emerged um, from the Persian Gulf. Now, Veracocha is quoted as saying, I don't know who wrote it down or, or how it you know, uh, made its way to print or oral tradition. He said, if my, my disciples saw my face, they would be horrified. A lot of these creatures were, were described as hybrid and grotesque, just like Oannes the fish god. Um, there, there, there's more to the story about uh, hybrids uh, and creatures of the past that Casey talks about as um, experiments went wrong in Atlantis. And I will get to that at a later date. I just wanted to end on <clears throat> this Veracocha statue in the German Museum that has six toes he is identified as this hybrid uh, bird god, and you find the bird being everywhere around the planet. You find it in Easter Island, isolated Pacific places, uh, you know, this bringer of knowledge, the bringer of mathematics and civilization. So 
the point I'm making here is I think that, you know, the scope of this, when you look at it, you have so many disparate sources giving the same specific story about the past that's rooted in this, this mythological uh, belief that, you know, we were created in a, in a distinctly different manner than evolution. You know, I, I just, uh, I believe that it rings true and, and I feel intuitively that there's something to the story. So that's why I like to share it. I like to give concrete examples of it, statue after statue after petroglyph after ancient chronicles writing and just lay it out and see what you think. You know, I, I, I feel like uh, modern anthropology, archeology, span and the sciences don't answer any of these strange stories of the past. None of these are addressed in a way that really makes sense. It's just like, ah, oh, those people, they talked about giants because they didn't know, they couldn't conceive of who built that site or the hybrid God is just some you know, guy who took too much uh, ayahuasca or something like that. This version, this Edgar Cayce's Lost World version in this comparative analysis, in fact, answers all these questions, albeit in a strange and maybe hard to take way for some people, but it certainly addresses all, all the high strangeness that is associated with human origins. So I thank you for your time um, and uh, thanks for listening.